about to leave Already packing, come with me I'm not really asking, we'll get away To a place where we don't know About to see, the world in action What we can be, life with no distractions We'll get away, this is what we waited for Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our latest A-Level Sociology Revision Blast. This is, I think, number eight. So we are returning to education, one of our popular topics. I think we started with education. We've got Duncan and Craig with us yet again this week. Hello. They just keep coming back for more. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. All good. I was just checking the stats yeah, on the previous seven sessions because I'm conscious lots and lots of people coming into the live stream as we speak. But actually, there's there's almost 20 to 30 times as many more people also log in and watch the replays. So maybe yeah. we ought to also say hello to anyone who's watching, not live, but on a replay. I think we've had something like 15,000 yeah. students uh, cover uh, watch the first uh, seven sessions. Um, so, Excellent. yeah, education, uh, lots to get through. Duncan, what's, what's the scope of what we're doing on this session? And then when you're ready, Absolutely. let's make a start. Yeah, sure. So we're going to look at some different aspects of education this time. Right back at the start of this, we looked um, particularly at some of the theory and also um, kind of differential achievement in education. This time we're looking at um, the functions of education um, and also some education policy. So that's where our focus is going to be today. We've got a range of activities to cover that. Um, for those of you who haven't joined us before, if you want to join in you can type into the chat window those of you who are with us live if you can type into the chat window your answers we'll keep an eye on those and respond to them um sometimes it'll be a b c or d if it's like a multiple choice question other times you might need to type a bit more in we'll explain when we get to those bits okay so should we get cracking okay let's go for it yeah brilliant okay so first up which sociologist wrote about the ideological state apparatus was it Davis and Moore, Karl Marx, Bowles and Gintis, or Louis Althusser? What do we reckon? 
but uh, one to get you started. Seeing some answers coming straight through, going straight through with their Ds. Shall we have a look? Well done. Absolutely. Does anyone know a famous fact about Louis Althusser? Someone always does. So if you have one, <laughs> stick one in the uh, <laughs> stick one in the uh, uh, chat window if you want to. Okay, should we look at the next question? Which of these sociologists argued that teachers had higher expectations of boys than girls? We've got Layla saying that Althusser was a Marxist. Absolutely. Um, Jim's suggesting he might have been a Liverpool fan. I'm not sure whether that's that's true. Anyway, we'll uh, keep going. So which of these sociologists argue that teachers had higher expectations of boys than girls? Is it A, Michelle Stanworth, B, Paul Willis, C, Mac and Gale, or D, Sue Sharp? Okay, now don't worry if you haven't heard of all these names. Um, you might be new to them. And just keep an eye on which way around it is. Teachers had higher expectations of boys than they did of girls. Okay, we've got a mixture of answers coming through here. Maybe this is a study you're not as familiar with. It is a little outdated now, of course, because um, mm -hmm. for the most part in education these days, girls tend to outperform boys. Um, but this study was looking at why, in particular, progress from, progression from uh, secondary school to university, why teachers might tend to think that boys are more likely to go on to university and therefore focus their attention on them. I've not seen a right answer yet. I don't know whether it's just because it hasn't come through on my, at my end, um, but it is actually, should we have a look? Hey, Michelle Stanworth. Okay, if you're not familiar with that one, it's worth having a look, but also, you know, to be critical of it, that, you know, is that, is it relevant to today's education? Sorry, well done, Holly, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, um, Never heard of her, Michelle. It, she's, um, yeah, so she's writing from a, a, a feminist perspective, um, trying to explain why, at the time, boys were more likely to go on to higher education. But it's not necessarily true anymore, so have a look at that one, um, but with a critical eye. Let's have a look at the next question. Which of these sociologists came from a Marxist perspective? Davis and Moore, Howard Becker, Sue Sharp, Bowles and Gintis. Of them were Marxists. Bit of a range again. Bit of a range of responses. But I think we're seeing more coming in for the correct answer, which is D, Bowles and Gintis, um, with the correspondence theory. Um, sometimes people do mistake Becker for a marxist who is an interactionist i think partly it's because we, we sometimes teach the uh the bees all together <laughs> in, so, in sociology of education we kind of go on oh, but bols and gintis bordia becker bernstein um but becker is an interactionist um and i think because he talks about social class and um you know people sometimes mistake him for a for a marxist but he wasn't okay one more mcq in, and this one, don't worry if you don't know it. I'll explain why it's quite useful to know in a moment. But I don't. You don't need to know the dates of all the studies, and don't panic if you don't. But in which years did Sue Sharp conduct her research? Was it 1950 and 1970, 1974 and 1996, 1983 and 2004, 1976 and 1994? Yeah, Becca did talk about the ideal people, yeah. Okay, we've got some Bs and Ds. B or D. Okay. I've got a little mixed bag here. And as I say, don't worry at all if you don't know this one. Um, and those of you saying B or D, you're definitely in the right ballpark because it is the 70s and the 90s when she conducted the research. The interesting thing to remember is that she conducted the research very shortly after the um, Sex Discrimination Act was passed in 1975. So it's worth, um, you know, knowing it, you know, ordinarily you don't really need to know the precise dates, although it's useful to know roughly what era things were written in. But um, it's interesting to know that that was part of the motivation in doing the study, because then she looked at what impact 
that sort of legislation, along with like the Equal Pay Act and other legislation, had had over 20 years or so um, on girls' aspirations in education. Okay, I am now going to hand over to Craig for a trapdoor activity. Thank you, Duncan. Um, often on the A-level uh, paper, sort of, you get asked questions, particularly when it comes to theory, um, about how um, the functions of education perform, uh, sorry, how education performs certain functions for society. So this is what this activity is looking at. You've got nine, um, uh, nine functions of the education system on the screen. And I want you to identify those that perform a, that perform a function that meets the needs of the economy. So something that might be linked into uh, how the economy performs. And this is one of those spec points where it talks about education and the economy. Well, how does education perform um, a function, uh, perform a function that benefits the economy? OK, so if you look at the nine um, on the screen, so passing on a, a dominant ideology, socialization into value consensus, legitimizing inequality, correspondence principle, teaching of specialist skills, transmitting patriarchal ideas, reproducing inequality, promoting social solidarity and promoting meritocracy. Which of those would serve a function? Uh, which, which of those functions would, would meet the needs of the economy? What, which of those would do that? So we've already got Louise coming through saying 1A, uh, passing on of the dominant ideology. It's interesting to know what is the dominant ideology that's passed on and 2B, Teaching and specialist skills, certainly, yep. Sana, we've got 1B, socialization into value consensus. Molly is going for promoting meritocracy. So Layla is said 2B as well, teaching and specialist skills. Amelia, A2. Uh, Layla's gone for 3C, 3C. There's a few people gone for that. 1C, legitimizing inequality. Um, if you can expand on how it would do that, that would be great as well in the, in the chat because people seem to be getting this one quite quickly today. I've um, got 3B, promoting social solidarity. Does that meet the needs of the economy? Might meet the needs of the economy if you're selling things like Union Jack mugs, but, you know, hey. <laughs> uh, Louise, 2C, um, transmitting patriarchal ideas. How might that serve the needs of the economy? That's I suppose one. you come to that in a minute. Yeah, I was just going to say. I suppose quite a lot of these, quite a lot of these, could sort of indirectly serve the needs of the economy. I guess we're looking for the ones that more directly Direct. do so. Mm. You know, if you were doing that, ideas one. yeah, transmitted patriarchal ideas. One, I'll, I'll come to that in a minute because I think it's it's quite interesting. You could you could yeah develop that into meeting the needs of the economy with a lot you of theoretical could, yeah. work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice analytical okay, so chains. If people are going to do them, it'd be great. Mm. It's it's a big chain to make, but you, know, you could do that, certainly. Mm -hmm. School teaches specialist skills which are necessary for the workforce. Yes, well done, Fatma. Um, by legitimising inequality, working class workers would believe they deserve a subordinate place in society who accept their tough labour. That's a good. really good one. Really good response there. Let's look at some of the responses then, because lots of people have got those. Can we look at the responses, please, Jim? Yeah, passing on a dominant ideology. Whose ideology does the education system pass on? Well, if you're a Marxist, you would suggest that it passes on the dominant ideology of capitalism, which, of course, is going to serve the needs of the economy. Legitimizing inequality. Uh, great answer there. So like by S.A. Bro. Sorry if I pronounced <laughs> that incorrectly. Um, saying legitimized inequality. So like it means that so like the workers, they will believe that they are of a lower status and will accept lower paid jobs. Our correspondence principle, of course, it prepares people for uh, the long shadow of work, which gets those right, uh, which which long shadow of work, which um, prepares them for being exploited in employment, which serves the needs of the economy. Teaching a specialist skills is pretty straightforward. Reproducing inequality, creating um, a generation of low paid workers. Um, obviously it serves the needs of the economy and promoting meritocracy, this idea if you work hard and you have ability, you will get ahead. It promotes competition and obviously that serves the needs of the economy. The one I would mention there, transmitting patriarchal ideas, you could develop that by looking at the idea of, right, okay, well, um, if we 
promote traditional values and we sort of like suggest that males should go out to work, females should stay at home. It serves the needs of the economy by creating this either A, reserve army of labour or B, unpaid domestic labour. I think it would be a little bit more of a stretch to do that, uh, to, to, to get that, but you certainly could um, give that as a yeah. response. Kind of Marxist feminist Holly, type response, couldn't There you go. Holly's, Holly's just put that pretty much the same thing there. For patriarchal yeah. ideas, keeps women in the home, male going to work. Yeah. And the, yeah. the women obviously then can sort of like take up um, roles um, when the economy expands and they would go back to the home when the economy contracts as part of this reserve army of labour that keeps wages lower. Okay. okay. Well done, everybody. Some really good responses. There. I like the way sort of like some people have elaborated on their responses too. This is kind of a type of question you might get as a 30 marker um, mm -hmm. for things like uh, functions of education. I think in 2017, it was the way education transmits norms, values and ideas. And what mm -hmm. you do is you apply those functions to say which of those do apply those. And likewise, how does it serve the needs of the economy would be a, another potential one, which looks like a Marxist question, but it can be very yeah, much functionalist yeah. as well. Over to you, Dunk. Okay, thanks very much. We've got an activity now called On Balance, where we're going to essentially make an argument, look at two sides of an argument. So to begin with, I'm going to ask you to come up with two arguments that support the view that the education system is meritocratic. And then we're going to look at some arguments on the other side. Now, looking at some of the fantastic responses in that last um, activity, I'm expecting to see some impressive arguments being put forward here, probably far more exciting than the ones that are going to come up on the graphic. But let's have a look. So um, seeing some arguments on the other side coming through first, so if we can stick with the arguments that support the view that the education system is meritocratic, first of all, and then we'll come to the to the other side um, in a moment. So Layla's saying that Marxists say that meritocracy is a myth. That's very much on the, the other side of the argument. Um, what are we thinking in terms of arguments that the education system is meritocratic? Any arguments that it is meritocratic, that if we think about what meritocracy means, it means people achieve their status, they get through hard work and ability, people reach their stations in life rather than through um, having lots of money or who your parents are and things like that. Um, can anyone suggest any arguments to say that the education system is meritocratic? Okay, we've got the functionalists believe it, absolutely, that believe that pupils are equal, rewarding and encourages hard work. This national curriculum oh, allows all students to study the same subjects up to the age of 16. That's brilliant. Also getting a few coming through on the other side of the argument. We'll, I'll return to those when we get to that bit. Okay, so some good points there. So we've got functionalists believe it, but we need to kind of go beyond that to think, well, why, what do they argue? How do they make that argument? We might want to think about so like how schools do promote meritocracy. Yeah, absolutely. How, how do we make sure that meritocracy occurs in schools? Okay, brilliant. Claudia said that there are exams taken by all the same exams. Everyone has access to free education. Ibrahim, the thing about the myth that's going to be on the other side of the argument, similarly, Poppy with Bowles and Gintis, we're going to talk about them probably on the other side of the argument. Um, encourages schools to select school to select children from poorer backgrounds. Okay, so it's you know it it's not we have free education yet. Not um, not there it was nice judged by universalistic standards. Reward individuals for working hard in lessons. Okay, so there's lots of really good responses there. So well done for getting there because I think sometimes we think about the other side of the argument more than we do this side of the argument. So I mentioned there was free access to education up to the age of 18, which I think someone else mentioned there. And we got the standardized public exams for all pupils most years. Um, so there's lots there. Um, we are going to be talking about some more education policy today, Leila. I'm just saying, can you do a live lesson on educational policy? There'll be some policy later today. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so, and Davison Moore, Poppy, well done. Yeah, absolutely. You'd link Davison Moore um, ideas to the idea that the education system is meritocratic. What about the other side of the argument then? We've already seen some of it, actually. Some of you have come through this idea of the myth, the myth of meritocracy, the Marxist idea that there's meritocracy is a myth. Um, we've, people have referred to, um, middle-class having advantages, um, 
Yeah, education and achievement is influenced by social class. It's not all down to hard work. Teacher labelling, Kieran, yeah, very good. Um, covert selection, Claudia mentioned there, really good. Um, Bowles and Gintis we could talk about here, couldn't we? Um, the myth of meritocracy. Um, yeah, the private schools, absolutely. Um, streaming, cultural deprivation, material deprivation. Um, not everyone's home backgrounds and socialisation is the same. Middle class people's benefit due to things like social capital and then cultural capital. Loads of really good, really good answers here. Cultural deprivation. We could debate that one another time, but it's a good, you know, it is, it's definitely an answer to this question. Private schools, again, labelling of students. Brilliant. OK, let's have a look at a couple that I've put. There's a very large achievement gap by social class. Someone mentioned that. I mean, you know, we look at all the different sort of predictors of how people will achieve in education, social class and the way we measure that tends to be free school meals or or not is by far the most sort of dramatic <laughs> um, predictor of how people achieve. There's a really big achievement gap. Um, and then we've got this idea, a few people mentioned private schools, 7% approximately of the UK population attend fee paying schools, but people who attended those schools make up 34% of the top positions, the, what we might call the elite positions in society. So there is there appears to be a significant advantage of being in that um, 7%. We've got some other great responses coming through about the elaborate code, ethnocentrism and institutional racism. Really good responses. So well done, everybody, on that one. We've got another little activity from me now, which is a missing vowels one. Now, not everyone loves yes, the missing vowels activity so i've gone for hopefully a very easy one to start with because the first word doesn't have any vowels in it. <laughs> so even when you take all the vowels out the whole word world the whole words there um but what i want isn't just what the what the term is if you can spot the term well done holly i think you're the first in there a few of you coming in there could you tell me roughly what it means i think we've heard quite a lot about it in that last activity but if someone wants to type a quick definition or who talked about it that kind of thing that would be brilliant to see but well done for spotting the myth of meritocracy well done so it's a, a marxist um concept yeah schools don't allow all students to have equal chances well done yeah so it's there appears to be this idea that everyone's at this you know everyone's going to be judged the same it appears that you know people will achieve their status in society meritocratically but actually there are lots of factors that suggest that it doesn't from a Marxist perspective. OK, um, next one. What do we reckon? Lots of good responses to that last uh, last point. What do we think this one is? Oh, well done, Georgia. It's the hidden curriculum. Holly as well. OK, does anyone want to give us a quick definition of the hidden curriculum? What do we mean by the hidden curriculum? Loads of people getting it, so well done. What is the hidden curriculum? Values learning schools, such as punctuality, respect for authority, etc. Absolutely. So it's really anything you learn at school that's not part of the kind of formal, formal curriculum. And it absolutely can be linked with the correspondence principle. Um, what's taught in school without it being on the spec? Well done. Um, it's worth bearing in mind that although we tend to talk about it from a Marxist perspective, and so it's kind of things that are taught that might be kind of a bad thing from a Marxist perspective, it doesn't have to be. Obviously, functionalists also believe that school teaches you lots of things um, beyond the content of lessons. You know, it teaches you, um, you know, that sort of social social solidarity stuff through all kinds of things that we do at school. Okay, so yeah, lots of really good definitions of the hidden curriculum there. Were you going to say something, Craig, before we, people can yeah, work this one out while we're doing Moving from uh, particularistic to universal values is usually done to yeah. the informal curriculum as well. So yeah, know. absolutely. What about this one then? What do we reckon? A bit harder, this one. Although you might be able to work out what a couple of the, couple of the words... Oh, wow. I said it was hard with this. When nothing's hard for this lot. They're leaping in with it. Fantastic. It is indeed the reproduction of class inequalities. Could anyone give us a quick 
explanation of what we mean by the reproduction of class inequalities. All of these are being, well, as I, apart from what I said about the hidden curriculum being potentially functionalist or Marxist, most of these have been Marxist ideas. What, what would we say in terms of the reproduction of class inequalities? Absolutely, Claudia, it's argued by Marxists. How does school reproduce class inequalities? Yeah, pupils are stuck in the cycle of deprivation. Very good. Yeah, school creates greater divides. It's the idea that through the school system, rather than a sort of meritocratic social mobility, for the most part, the children of middle class parents go on to go into middle class jobs and the children of working class parents go on to do working class jobs through the education system. Kind of the opposite of the sort of um, the sort of meritocratic functionalist idea. OK, um, that's fantastic. Right, I'm going to hand back to Craig now for the big reveal. Thank you, Duncan. Um, if, you've, uh, if you've been tuning in um, over the past few weeks, we've done a few of these big reveals before. What we do is, for those who haven't, um, and if you haven't, where have you been? Um, where, <laughs> where, where, what we do is we reveal a clue um, and you have to kind of guess um, what links them together. In this instance, it would be, you know, what kind of topic area might link these clues together? So if we look at our first piece of uh, research that's in here, Please. Yeah. Oh, it's up. <laughs> yep. Research that was done by uh, Merton Mack and Guile. So what area of the specification might you associate Mack and Guile with? There are a few, the few possibilities at the moment, aren't there? Because you didn't only totally There are. Right about one area. Yeah, the, yes, agenda, subcultures. Yeah, we're looking at that. Could be. Let's look at reveal a second one. Louise Archer. Again, another one that could be Mm. A few different areas. We're talking about crisis masculinity. That's a good, good guess. Let's look at our third one. Academic achievers, new enterprise. Good guess. Um, Becky Francis, uh, Professor Becky Francis. Francis. George has said going for ethnicity. Molly's going for ethnicity. Still seeing ethnicity and gender. Okay, so it's still a little bit open there. Dennis Cord, this should really kind of throw it a little bit more one way or the other. Louise has gone for ethnicity as well. And our final one, Heidi Merza. Which again could potentially be either, couldn't it? <laughs> but there are definitely some that push it one way in there. It could be. The, the latter two sort of tend to push it a little bit more yeah. to yeah. um to ethnicity which is the answer yeah by the way if you don't know all these studies not it's not something to panic about um because sometimes some teachers will teach some different studies occasionally but if you know you should know a few of them at any rate if you think about mac and gal mac and gal sort of like looked at um the impact of racism on asian pupils in the sixth form mm -hmm. uh, louise archer looked at Mus uh, looked at the i sorry the identities formed by muslim boys in education, uh, Becky Francis looked at Chinese students and their achievements. Dennis Cord looked at the ethnocentric curriculum, and Heidi Safi Mersia looked at the idea of um, teachers' uh, reactions, teacher racism, where she talked about sort of like the colorblind, the liberal chauvinist, the crusader teachers. Dennis Cord looked at the ethnocentric curriculum. That's what that one was. Okay, so we move on to our next one, please, Jim. Okay, so we're looking now at um, Stephen Ball. Stephen Ball is our first big reveal. Straight in there, Claudia, with anti and pro school subcultures. Okay, a good one. Miriam David. Poppy, is that streaming or steaming? Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. I think it's streaming. Um, Amelia's talking about social class. That There's a little bit of social class in there, yeah, but it, it's not the topic we're looking for there. Gilborn and Udell. What was Gilborn and Udell's famous concept linked to? Ethnocentric curriculum. We can see why people have gone with that because David Gilborn is kind of closely linked with things like critical race theory. Um, it's not this one. Banding and streaming. We're getting closer a little bit. Educational triage is a nice one there. Let's get number four. Sharon Gerwitz. They did all play for Arsenal, not in the Invincibles team. 
educational triage, Sharon Gerwitz, Gerwitz, Ball and Bow, their research. What was their research into, if you can remember? Talking about people choosing anti-school subcultures. And then we go to Chubb and Mo. Now, if you know that one, that might. Chubb and Mo should be the way. giveaway. Ooh. Oh, Esha, well done. Marketization. Yeah. They're all pieces of research that talk about the impacts of marketization and educational achievement. Ball described uh, the myth of parentocracy. And uh, Miriam David came up with the concept of parentocracy. Gilborn and Udell talked about the A, A to C economy uh, and educational triage. Gerwitz looked at different types of choosers, different type of parental choosers, skilled choosers, uh, local disconnected choosers, and Chilba Mo, obviously, um, from the new right perspective, proposed that education was inefficient and needed to be marketized through the use of vouchers. Well done to those who got marketization. Well done. Yep. So as you can see, we're moving a little bit closer to policy now. So you might look at this. So changes to the curriculum. What topic area might this be under? This, this is a little bit tougher. <laughs> Certainly so Changes far. Changes <laughs> mm. Our next one. The influences on classroom teaching. What could be the topic that we're looking at here? It's a tough one. Don't know if the screen's frozen or everyone's thinking. Gender in education. I could see where you go with that, but no. Butler Actor Education Reform Act. Not quite. Well, not, well, I just say no. Increased privatization. <laughs> what process has led to increased privatization in the education system? Ooh, Amelia. Ooh. That could be what well, that could be good. That was number four. Broader range of schools. Holly's following in there. Education reform, labor policies. No, some of them are, you know, some of them can be sort of like seen as being part of labor policies, increase the faith schools. And there's the giveaway, international tests like PISA and TIMS. It's not conservative policy. It's not coalition policy. Few We've people have it got it. There. Louise has got it. Holly's got it. Ash has, uh, Amelia's got it. It is. Louise. Can we read it, please, Jim? Louise has got it. Yes, I've saw Louise. Yeah, Louise has got it. It is the impacts of globalization on education, educational policy. So changes to the curriculum, sort of like reforms to the curriculum around 2000 to take into account the um, increased migration into the UK and make the curriculum broader. Influence on classroom teaching. Classroom teaching obviously is now more influenced by international research that is done in education. Increased privatization uh, with expansion of global um, uh, global exam board. Um, so people like Pearson have op operate um, exams in sort of like 70 different countries, broader range of schools drawing on influences from Sweden, the USA, and even sort of like things like faith schools can be seen as a, an, as a reaction to globalization as well, with free schools in, from Sweden and academies from the US, and the international tests and sort of like how that influences the way in which we are taught. Okay, thank you very much. I'll pass back over to Duncan now for his um, place and policies in order. Okay, so this is a timeline activity. We've got some years down the left hand side, which go in chronological order, A, B, C, D, E, F. And we've also got one, two, three, four, five, six, some policies or policy um, developments. What I'd like you to do is link the year with the policy year. So you can either work them all out and put them in order, or as few people are already doing, um, pick out some ones that you know and put those on there. Okay, so I've seen some good, good correct question. answers already. Let's have a look. So which do you think? Where do they where do they sit? I'll give you a minute or two to have a have a look at it. Yeah, and you can either just go, um, as some of you do, and just a number and a letter, or you can type it out the year and what it is. Entirely up to you. Lots of right answers coming through. Well done.
Oh, Amelia's gone for a for a very uh, thorough answer there. I'm just checking it. It's looking pretty good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well done. Okay, shall we have a look at it then? I think a few of you've a few of you got it right, and lots of you getting many of them correct. So, 1944 was the the Butler Act, which introduced the tripartite system. I think most people spotted that one. 1965 was the year where there was the largest expansion of comprehensive schools. There wasn't a sort of single one big sweeping piece of legislation for comprehensive schools. Some had been introduced earlier than that. There continued to be new ones later, but that was kind of the biggest wave of it under Tony Crossland. Um, the Education Reform Act in 1988, lots of you getting that one. Um, and I've put the helpful thing there was marketization. Um, the introduction of Shaw Start in 1998, so it was an early new labor policy. The Academies Act that included the introduction of free schools was indeed 2010. It was an early coalition policy. Academies had predated that. City academies had been brought in under New Labour, but the Academies Act allowed all schools to convert to academy status um, and also introduced free schools. And well spotted that T levels have appeared, although obviously under the current circumstances, um, I'm not sure, you know, when they, the first ones, the first ones will be sat, or whatever. They are okay. now quarantine levels. <clears throat> <laughs> Q levels, yeah. Um, Q levels. What age are T levels taken? I think they're they're. Um, that's they're a good question. To, they are the equivalent to um, B tech level two, level three. So they're basically they're, they're designed yeah. to replace them. Uh, they they fall into like seven different categories. The vocational <laughs> qualifications that are essentially 16 to 19. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so well done with your answers on that. I'm going to hand back to Craig for one last policies activity. Thank you very much, Duncan. As you can see in front of you, there are 16 policies uh, on this grid, and we're going to group them into four sets of four. Um, what I would like you to do, first of all, is have a quick look at those policies and see if you can see any kind of current themes. Um, so if you identify some of the groups that these policies may be in, um, and then we'll go through and try and uh, try and tack four policies into each of the four themes that exist here. A um, little bit of a trick. There is one. Um, there is there is one group uh, that has been kind of split into two, if you like. <laughs> one set of policies have been split into two because they do, they do kind of two different things if you like so we've got city center academies people premium education maintenance allowance free schools just and wise league tables gcse's and coursework expansion of faith schools expansion of academy academies reading champions universal technic university technical colleges lockdown laptops which is just something i've decided to call them uh national literacy strategy open enrollment standardized tests and formula funding looking at some of uh, the responses so far they're not coalition government policies some of them will be coalition government policies but that's not one of the categories so the categories craig about the, are they about the purpose of the, about the purpose about the purpose yeah. of the policies really so globalization policies and effects um no is not one of them compensatory education i'll give you that one because we will we'll look at that in a minute <laughs> because compensatory education um looks at the idea that sort of like um, there are policies that are there to tackle inequalities all types of schools um, no, it, it's a it's a little bit more than that. Policies to raise achievement, marketization. Well done, Poppy. Marketization will actually take out eight of those policies, and we'll split that down <laughs> into two, and reduce class inequalities. Yeah. Okay. And what other Good type people. of inequalities might it be? We we addressing Oh, gender differences there. there you go well done um what i've done is i've actually split the marketization policies because they are very um they there's lots of marketization policies in education mm -hmm. over the last 40 years um i've split them down into policies that increase choice and increase competition so the first one we're going to look at is i want you to identify four policies on there that promote competition between schools or students 
that promote competition. Parentocracy, okay, we mean sort of like some of the ones that are in the grid. League tables, Molly, yes, that does promote competition. There's one. League I'll tables. Remember league tables. GCSEs. GCSEs and coursework is, is in another category. But if you think about what a GCSE is, formula funding is in there. Yeah, that's two. Open enrollment, three. Not GCSEs and coursework, but what is a GCSE? Holly's got it, standardized testing. So if we can really reveal those four, please, Jim. There you go, lead tables, open enrollment, standardized testing and formula funding all promote competition between schools because they are competing for resources, namely students and funding. Next one is promoting four, uh, sorry, it's promoting choice. So any of those four that promoted choice for pupils and parents, any of those that promoted and I think somebody mentioned earlier on types of schools. Um, that mm. would be good, but it was actually talking about promoting choice, but that might be something you look at. Uh, pupil premium wouldn't be in that choice one. Uh, sorry, in the competition one. Um, pupil premium we'll look at a little bit later on. I'll explain what but, the difference between pupil premium. Free and schools and faiths. Free schools and faith schools. Free schools, well, faith schools, yeah. Pupil premium wouldn't be in choice. No. Um, no, GCSE and coursework wouldn't be in there either. Expansion of faith schools, city centre academies. Tried the other could've, type. Could've, it could have been. Expansion of academies. Have been. It could have been. It could have mm -hmm. been. But the other one promoted, the other expansion of academies promoted far more choice. Yeah. And university technical schools. Well done, Shannon. You've got the last one in there. Thank you. Can we reveal this, please, Jim? Thank you very much. And now we're going to look at policies that tackle economic inequality. So which of those remaining eight policies would have been there to tackle economic inequality in education? Or, yeah, or social class. Yeah. Social class, yeah. People, people premium, premium, yes. People premium. Education maintenance allowance, that's two. Lockdown laptops, that is correct. We're not arguing that they are effective, but what we're arguing <laughs> is these were policies that were put into place um, to tackle um, um, inequalities based on, on economic situations. Lockdown laptops, people premium, people premium. Um, we have, there was one we mentioned before, originally, they were originally created for inner city areas of deprivation that attracted additional funding and they were allowed to be run by businesses. Nobody's got it yet. Oh, Louise has, I think. Yay, there you go, yeah. City Centre Academies are introduced under New Labour. Many people get confused and think that the Conservatives introduced academies. It was New Labour who introduced them. Um, the City Centre Academies originally um, um, a series what would happen was a number of schools would merge in inner city areas and they would be given new facilities have additional funding and they would be run um, by private enterprise and therefore would be seen as better and the last one what do you what's think we've already established what's the link we've already established the link i think we've already established the link didn't we we mentioned that earlier on yes the last one would be tackling gender inequality so just and wise, obviously, gender inequality and subject choice, particularly in the sciences, GCSEs and coursework. This was to address um, the under underachievement of girls at the time back in 1986, 1987. Reading champions and national literacy strategy. <laughs> I can't say that. National literacy strategy. Um, all uh, were there to target boys underachievement by assuming uh, by uh, tackling the idea that boys don't read and they have lower levels of literacy skills. And that completes that task. Some really, really good responses through there. It's social policy is one thing that's sort of like, I don't think any of you have to worry about there. Some really strong, really strong answers. Yeah, really good. And it's something people were asking for, I think, social policy. It's not everyone's favorite bit, but it's, um, no. you know, really useful to know, particularly some of those more recent policies. And there was good, good levels of knowledge there. So well done. Mm. Yeah, great session. Hopefully you enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to give 
Duncan and Craig, the thumbs up. <laughs> if you're watching live, and of course, if you're watching a replay, and there'll be thousands of you do that, give the video a thumb up, thumbs up as well. Uh, any comments on the uh, the session, uh, put them into the chat. Or, of course, you can add them to the comments on YouTube. There'll be a, a replay of this available within a few minutes of this session finishing. And you can also go to the tutoryou.net forward slash live site to download all the slides if you want to look back over this session or any of the other A-level, uh, AQA level sociology sessions. We've done eight so far. So lots for you to, to go back and maybe add those to your notes or to look at the sessions. But Craig, just to Duncan, mention, fantastic. So just to, thanks. Just to mention to Louise, we have done um, a research method session for both A level and GCSE, so you can have a look at those. Yeah, that'll be yes, on the Louise replay section there. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, great stuff. What's next? I can't remember what we said. <laughs> we'll uh, we'll we have be to do the here. Of crime. I think Second we're back on crime, crime and Stevens. Yeah, crime, crime, yeah. crime number two, yeah. isn't it? So yeah, crime two, crime two. Yeah, so so crime two. So we'll be here same, same time, crime, same place crime, next week. Yep, same time, same place next week for some of the trickier aspects of crime. Actually, so if you mm -hmm. you're doing crime at the moment, you might want to join us and uh, put yourself through your paces. <laughs> Brilliant. Well done. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Craig, Duncan, go put your feet yeah. up. Great session, uh, <laughs> and we'll see you. We'll see you Later. next week. Yeah. Bye. Cheers, guys. See you. Bye-bye.